Christmas time, I love the hymns. It's a delight to sing about the Incarnation and how many of them point to the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the sinless God-man who came to earth to die for us. Marvelous, wonderful truths that are sung in those Christmas carols, and I think we ought to sing them more often throughout the year, uh, just to remind ourselves of who Jesus really is. Tonight we are looking at part two of Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder. The practical application, we didn't get to that last week. We talked about some of the underlying theology, but tonight we want to talk about the practical application. Ten different points, as a matter of fact. I hope we can get through all of them. But uh, what does that have to do with us? As you go through daily life, it's perhaps interesting to hear sermon about Egyptians, Greeks, Egyptians, uh, <laughs> Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder, but does that have anything to do with you? Does it have anything to do with me? Does it have anything to do with the church? Does it have anything to do with the way in which we are supposed to respond to the world around us? And yes, I think it does. So turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 21. I'm going to begin reading in verse 26. We're going from verses uh, 26 all the way down to 40. Acts 21, 26 through 40. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further, brought Greeks also into the temple and has polluted this holy place. They had seen before with him in the city Trophimus, an Egypt Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him, and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, and some another, among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was, that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him! Away with him! And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that, that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us down to the wilderness, four thousand men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and, and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we look again into your word, we pray that it will penetrate our hearts and enable us to learn how to deal with the difficult situations of life. Times of chaos, times of confusion, times of false accusations, times of danger, times of dealing with the government times of dealing with irrational people. Father, we find much of that here in this text tonight, and we pray that you'll give us wisdom as we seek to apply the Word of God to the daily living in the Christian life. So, Father, we pray for your blessings on this time together, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall that last week we ended with a little extra material, which actually tied into the previous sermon on skewed reports and weaker brethren, which was back in verses 18 through 25. And we added some very important issues about who are the weaker brothers. We also discussed why weaker brothers 
should not always remain weaker brothers because if they do so they will control the church through their carnality and there are many many churches all over the United States in fact I'm sure all over the world though my primary knowledge is here in the United States but there are many churches which are controlled by weaker brothers who insist on having their own way because they claim they are the weaker brother and therefore everyone must do what they want the weaker brother so called to do but we saw that there's some very clear instructions about how the church is to treat weaker brothers and there were four general areas that we covered number one first spiritually weaker brothers are in fact real brothers a lot of times we don't like to admit that but in fact they are our brothers but they should not be included in questionable discussions and issues where scripture may not be clear leadership is the one that deals with those issues not the weaker brothers and how do they apply in current life situations they definitely should not be consulted in setting church policy determining church activities writing church doctrinal statements or other things where their weakness may affect others and we saw the definition of that in Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 21 and also in Romans chapter 15 how we who are stronger brothers should bear the infirmities of the weak an infirmity is a sickness it's not something you want to remain in an infirmity is perhaps physical damage to your body it's not a way that you want to remain so people who claim to be weaker brothers continuously are telling you either they don't want to get well or they're not in fact really sick second stronger Christians should be willing to give up their rights as needed for the sake of weaker brothers uh, we need to learn deference because we do not want to hurt them in their spiritual growth and we saw that there are two parts to that particular issue number one the failure of strong Christians to show deference to weak Christians is a manifestation of pride selfishness and ultimately that will destroy the weaker brother stronger brothers should not be exercising pride should not be exercising selfishness they need to show deference to those who are genuinely weak as they care for them you don't take someone who is going through rehabilitation and the first thing you do is you drag them out on the track and insist that they run a four minute mile and you drag them around the track with a car it doesn't work that's not how you treat the weaker brother the one who is sick the one who is damaged number two the weaker brother is not one who loudly objects to what you do and that is a confusion that unfortunately reigns in many churches that the guy who is the loudest objector must be the weakest brother and so uh, you've got to do what he says you see a weaker brother is someone who is tempted to do what you would do without any problems but it injures his conscience the man who's loudly objecting would objecting would never be tempted to follow your example the weaker brother is the one who follows your example he's the one who does what you do as a matter of Christian liberty but his conscience tells him that it's wrong in fact your action may be okay it may be in fact your Christian liberty but because the connection the weaker brother makes in his mind to something in his past for him it is sin and we look to 1st Corinthians chapter 4 verses 10 and following 1st Corinthians 8 7 uh, and following uh, 1st Corinthians chapter 9 Paul Paul gives a lot of discussion <clears throat> on that particular issue the third thing that we looked at concerning the weaker brother is the stronger brother is not necessarily the one who holds to the strictest interpretation of the law in other words to the letter of the law many people who hold to the letter of the law are quite proud of that and they consider themselves to be the stronger brothers because they are insisting on holding to the letter of the law that does not necessarily make you a stronger brother many who think of themselves as stronger brothers are in fact the worst examples of Christian maturity because they violate the scripture in the ways they fail to realize this then sets them as an example of destruction for the weaker brothers and Paul gives illustration of that in Romans chapter 2 we discussed it how the Jews thought themselves as the strongest of all of the people of all societies behold thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God they were strict literalists they were strictly you know by the direct interpretation of the law this is how things in fact are but Paul goes on and he says you know his will you prove the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law you're confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind a light of them which are in darkness they thought pretty highly of themselves uh, they had a very pompous opinion of themselves you're confident of that you're an instructor of the foolish a teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law but he says but you know you're lawbreakers all of you 
Thou therefore that teaches another, teachest not thou thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Our Lord Jesus Christ covered all of these issues in his conflicts with the Pharisees who were the strictest interpreters of the law and pointed out that they'd broken every one of the commandments. And he goes on and says, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. In other words, you can, you can rely on the flesh, but you are a lawbreaker. So the stronger brother is not necessarily the one who holds to the strictest interpretation of the law. The fourth point that we discussed last week in some detail was being a weaker brother means that you are carnal and not spiritual. Being a weaker brother is nothing to boast about. Saying, well, I have a tender conscience on that issue. That's nothing to boast about. What you need to do is grow up. What you need to do is move from carnality to spirituality. What you need to do is learn what the Word of God says on the subject and then ask the Spirit of God to apply the Word of God to your life and revolutionize your life, change your life, conform you to the image of Christ, enable you to grow up so that you might in fact be an example for other believers, so that you might become one of the stronger brothers, so that you might encourage and help those who are yet young in their faith to mature in Christ. And that's what, and that was from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We expect babies to grow up. They can't continue in a state of spiritual infancy. And unfortunately, too many weaker brothers, so-called, have learned to manipulate other Christians by insisting on remaining in a state of spiritual infancy. Babes in Christ. That brought us to the section that we are looking at tonight in Acts about Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder. And that's what we come to now is the practical application of the lessons which we have learned. We just read the text for you. I'll not read it again. But here's lesson number one. It's a hard lesson to learn. It's a lesson that I struggled with many, many times as I was going through high school and college because it just didn't seem right. I knew what I was doing was the right thing to do, but I didn't seem to be getting good results as a result of that. Lesson number one, which is clearly illustrated in the passage, in which I've personally experienced trying to go through life and doing things right. Number one, sometimes when you do the right thing, it will get you into trouble. <laughs> Have any of you ever experienced that? You've done the right thing, and it got you into trouble. Nobody? That's amazing. <laughs> well, at least one hand went up. Okay. I have discovered over and over that many times when I've done the right thing, it got me into trouble. That's what happened to Paul here. Paul is doing the right thing. He is finishing off his vow. It's a vow that he made, and the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, says, you know, when thou vows to God, a vow to God, you know, pay that thou hast vowed. Otherwise, God's going to consider you a fool. He'll destroy the works of your hands. Keep your promises. Do what you say you're going to do. Don't waffle on it. Don't try to wiggle out of it. Just do it. Do the right thing. Leave the results to God. We talked about that last week. The devil's crowd will always try to slander you. He will, the, that crowd will always lie about you. They'll try to trip you up. They'll attack you. They'll mess up your life. It doesn't matter. What matters is what God says and how he views what you are doing. Do what is right. You must always do the will of God. Peter explains it to us over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Please turn over there to chapter 4 of 1 Peter because he tells you that sometimes when you do the right thing, it will get you into trouble. Now, if you've never gotten into trouble for doing the right thing, maybe the reason is you have not been doing the right thing. Didn't see a whole lot of hands go up on that. So maybe that's the real problem. Listen to what Peter says about it. 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 12. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. If you've never been through that, it probably means you're living a miserable, wishy-washy, compromising, timid, fearful, uncounting Christian life. You counted the cost and you said, I don't want to pay the cost. Peter says, don't think it's strange. If you're living like a Christian, if you're living the way God wants you to live, if you are doing the right thing, it will get you into trouble. It happened to Paul here, and Peter explains it theologically. 
Don't think of it as some strange thing happening to me. When I was growing up, I thought strange things were happening to me because I did right and then I would get into trouble for it. He tells you how to respond. I'm glad I found this passage. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. I've told you about some situations whereby a person did the right thing. One of my relatives was working for a company, and the boss told that particular relative to lie and say that he wasn't in the office when, in fact, he was in the office, and that relative wouldn't do it, and as a result, got fired. That's doing the right thing and suffering as a result of doing the right thing. Rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. The one his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, not for other things, but if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. When you do right and suffer for it, something is going on that you can't see but is a reality. The spirit of glory and of God is resting on you. Now, I suspect that all of us, if we took it out of its context, if I asked the question, how many of you would like the spirit of glory and of God to rest upon you? Now, I know they ask that in charismatic <laughs> meetings and everybody raises their hands and starts talking in tongues. That's not what Peter's talking about here. But how many of you would like the spirit of glory and of God to rest upon you? No hands? Okay, we have a few hands on that one. Yes, we want that, but we don't want the thing that accompanies it. Rejoice. That's how you're supposed to respond when the pain comes, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Are you able to thank him? To rejoice? Joy is different than happiness. Joy in the New Testament always appears in the context of the darkest, blackest, deepest, most painful troubles. Happiness is a result of circumstances. Joy is a result of having an abiding knowledge of the presence of Christ in your life, knowing that you're in the center of God's will regardless of what happens. Rejoice. Rejoice. Because you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory may be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Was that going on with the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 21? Yes. <laughs> Were they speaking evil of him? Yes. Was he doing what was right? Yes. Were they calling him an evildoer? Yes. But was he? No. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. If you're suffering for Christ, that's one thing. But if you're suffering for your own stupidity, that's another thing. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. You say, well, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. No, not me. I'm not an evildoer. Oh, have you ever been a busybody. <laughs> you know, Paul hits everybody with that. We've all stuck our nose into somebody else's business when it didn't relate to us. Have you ever suffered for being a busybody? You ought to have. Maybe you got away with it. At least you thought you got away with it. Let none of you suffer as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Was Paul ashamed when he got nabbed, beat up? They were going about to kill him until the, the Romans came down and rescued him. Was he embarrassed? Was he ashamed? Or did he say to the chief captain, man, I'm sure glad you picked me up because I need to say something to these folks out here. And you have just given me a fantastic platform where I'm looking over all of them. They can all hear me. They can all see me. And he waits for him to get silent. You see, Paul responded a little differently 
And most of us would in that situation. We'd say, get me out of here. Get me inside the castle quick. Uh, somebody might throw a rock and hit me in the head. Somebody might actually shoot an arrow at me. Somebody might throw a spear at me. Get me out of here. That wasn't Paul's response, was it? If any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And that's exactly what Paul did. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Do you know where it's going to start? It's not going to start with the sodomites. Not going to start with the rapists. Not going to start with the murderers. You know where it's going to start? He tells you right here. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? We skip passages like that, don't we? You are first up on the docket. How are you dealing with it? Verse 18, For if the righteous scarcely be saved, as brands from the burning plucked out of the fire, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So remember that when you suffer. That's his conclusion in verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Did you know you will never go through a time of suffering that is not the will of God if you are suffering as a Christian? Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. When you suffer, how are you supposed to respond? With well-doing. And you know, it's interesting, he takes you back to creation. Not merely back to the cross, he takes you all the way back to creation. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I'd like to spend some time on that, but I've got ten points to make and I've already used up fifteen minutes. I've only got through one point. All right, lesson two. Lesson one was, sometimes when you do the right thing, it'll get you into trouble. That's what all that was about. Lesson number two, you may, in fact, be in the process of setting a godly example for others to follow. Not just doing the right thing, but you're trying to set an example for other people to follow. In this case, it happened to be Paul setting the example for a group of men and all the believers in Jerusalem who were sort of confused and fuzzy on that issue of the law. He was setting an example for with a group of men who were extracting themselves, extracting themselves, finalizing and finishing off the requirements of the law. When then suddenly trouble hit the fan for him. You know, even though that's coming, you still have to set the example. Regardless of what other people do, you still have to set the example. If you're a mature Christian, the issue of setting an example is critical. Sometimes when you set the godly example, you'll get into trouble. You're going to suffer for it. The Old Testament prophets set the example even though they suffered for it. And we find these things, I'm not just making this up. These are things that are specifically stated in the New Testament. I'll give you a verse for each one of my points here. The Old Testament prophets set the example even though they suffered for it. James 5.10 Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. The Old Testament prophets set the example on that. Paul's not unique in it. Jesus set the example even though he suffered for it. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. 1 Peter 2.21 For even heretofore were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Paul set the example even though he suffered for it. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which so walk as ye have us for an example. 2 Thessalonians 3, 9, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Paul exhorts Timothy to set the example regardless of the consequences. 1 Timothy 4, 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. On the other side of the equation, we need to realize and understand that there are consequences for setting a bad example. Hebrews 4.11 
Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. When you set the example of unbelief, you cause others to fall. Unbelief is refusing to do what you know what God wants you to do. Knowing what the Word of God says and saying, I'm not going to do that because it's going to cost something. I'm not going to do that because it doesn't stimulate my flesh. I'm not going to do that because I really don't want to and I don't care what anybody thinks. You not only lose heavenly rewards for yourself, but you are setting an example that will cause others to fall through your unbelief. That's a serious issue, and you will come under the chastening hand of God for it. Oh, how adults damage children, for example, by insisting on their rights to drink or to smoke or to take drugs or to fool around and fornicate and commit adultery and other things like that. I think our kids will never know. Or perhaps petty theft. Or perhaps cheating a little bit on our income taxes. Or all the other sanitized things that Christians do that you really know are wrong. That brings us to lesson number three. I've mentioned this in passing in the past, but I'm going to give it to you again because it's here in the text. You will never be any place where somebody doesn't know who you are. Look at verse 27. When the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. There were guys from hundreds of miles away who knew Paul. They were from Asia. They weren't local Jews from Jerusalem. They were Jews from Asia, where Paul had been going on his missionary journeys. There is always... Somebody, no matter where you go, who knows who you are. Now, there are two points to that. Number one, clearly God knows where you are and who you are. God is watching. He is always there. And he knows who you are and where you are. Genesis 16, 13, she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? God sees you. We used to teach our kids that phrase, God, thou God, seest me. Thou God, seest me. It's a reminder to the little kids. It wasn't a big, long Bible verse for them to learn, four little words, but you know what we taught them? Thou God, seest me. Even when Abba and Ema are not around, thou God, seest me. Even when there's nobody else in the room, thou God, seest me. What are you doing? Thou God, seest me. Nail that to your conscience. Build that into your life. Thou, God, seest me. But you know, God always has witnesses who will be able to testify against us. God never lays down a principle in his word that he doesn't also establish in the practical life of reality. It's the issue of the witnesses. We find it at least four times in the New Testament. I just pulled out four of them. Matthew 18, 16, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee two or more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. 2 Corinthians 13, 1, This is the third time I am coming unto you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 1 Timothy 5, 19, Against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Hebrews 10, 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. There's always going to be somebody who knows what you've done who's seen you do it, who's heard you say it, who's perceived the situation in which you're walking as you walk into a bar, as you walk into some place of ill repute. Thou God seest me. God says, yes, and I'm going to make sure that there's some witnesses that see you too. Because God will keep his church pure. Remember that. Lesson three, you will never be any place where somebody doesn't know who you are. Lesson number four. There's always somebody who doesn't like what you're doing. <laughs> I know we've all experienced that one. There's always somebody who doesn't like what you're doing, even when you're doing right, and they're going to cause you some trouble. But remember, remember, we talked about the weaker brother. It doesn't necessarily make them the weaker brothers whom you must avoid offending. 
because we are surrounded by critical people who are not weaker brothers, who will never be tempted to do what they are criticizing. Peter explains it this way. We'll go back over there to 1 Peter again. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. Look at how Paul responds in our text. He doesn't try to render evil for evil. He doesn't try to criticize them. He doesn't say, I'm a Roman citizen and Jews were trying to kill a Roman, so you better do something about that. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. He doesn't stand up there and shout and curse at them in Hebrew. But contrarywise, blessing. He's giving them a blessing by telling them who Jesus is. Knowing that you are there and too cold, that you should inherit a blessing. What did God call Paul to do? Testify of Christ. There unto you are called that you should inherit a blessing. Do you think God gave him a blessing as a result of what he did there on the stairs that day? I think so. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good and let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, Verse 13, because this really applies to what's going on in our text. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? You know what? God rescued Paul. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happier are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. He just discussed that in chapter 2, which we looked at just a minute ago. How are you to respond? Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, set him apart. Push everything else out of the way. Make him central focus. Let him be the one that you're thinking about. Don't get distracted by all the, all the extraneous thoughts about what will happen if. Forget those things. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And there's more practical stuff as well. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The first thing it's going to affect is the way you talk. Are you ready? Are you always ready? That's not most of the time. Not 50% of the time. Be always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You don't do it arrogantly. You don't do it pompously. You don't do it with a sassy mouth. You do it with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience. Ah. You know, you can't do that unless you have a clean conscience. Very hard to witness to somebody while you're sitting at the bar stone drunk and trying to tell them about Jesus. You've got to have a good conscience. You have to know that your sins are forgiven. You have to be up to date in confessing and repenting of your sins, not walking in darkness, walking in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship with one another, whereby the blood of Jesus Christ will continually cleanse you from all sin. That will provide the good conscience. We'll talk about conscience in just a second here. That whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers. Was that happening to the Apostle Paul? In Acts 21, were they speaking of him as an evildoer? This is the guy that everywhere, in every place, teaches all the people. And he teaches them against the law. And he teaches them against this holy temple. Was that what Paul was doing? Every place that he went, the first thing he'd do, he'd stand up and say, you know, the temple is really, really a bad place. It stinks at the temple. And the law, oh man, the law is so evil. Is, did Paul say that? That's what they accuse him of. They speak evil of you as of evildoers. But you know what? If you sanctify the Lord God in your heart, if you're ready to give an answer to every man for the reason of the hope that lies in you, which Paul was doing in this case with meekness and fear, it says, when you do that with a good conscience, they will be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation. That is manner of life. Ah, so we have not only your speech, not only your conscience, but now we have your actions that falsely accuse your good conversation or manner of life in Christ. The way you respond, and I told you this is going to be practical application of our text from 
last week, and now it's the second part. How does it change the way you live? If the Bible is not changing the way you live, it means you're not applying it the way God intended it to be applied. For it is better, verse 17, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. What a lesson to learn for each one of us. There's always somebody who doesn't like what you're doing, even when you're doing right. They'll try to cause you trouble. But it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Lesson number five. We're making it. Lesson five. If you're doing right, that in itself will force your accusers to mix the truth with lies. <laughs> they won't have anything to say about you. So they're going to have to resort to lies which they're doing in the case of the Apostle Paul. He wasn't doing anything wrong. If you're doing right, that will force your accusers to mix the truth with lies. Verse 27 and 28 of Acts 21. When the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man. He, here he is! Here he is! He's right here! That teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place. He is so anti-Semitic, it isn't even funny. He teaches against the people. Was Paul anti-Semitic? Or did Paul say, you know, I'm willing to give up my own salvation that my brethren, the Jews, might be saved? Romans chapter 11. We looked at it a little bit this morning. I don't know if I could say that. Would I be willing to give up my own salvation for the salvation of the nation of Israel? and burn forever in hell. Now I can't do it, neither could Paul. Paul wasn't anti-Semitic. Paul was a Jew. He was proud of the fact that he was a seed of Abraham. He was an Israelite. He was a Benjaminite. Ah, oh, people. How much do you love the lost? Paul loved them, even was willing to die to carry the gospel to people who didn't know Christ. Against the people and the law in this place, and further hath brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. If you're doing right, that will force your accusers to mix the truth with lies. But just remember the source of all lies. And that when people must lie about you to get you into trouble, you must be doing what is right. If they really had something to accuse you of, they wouldn't have to resort to lies. And you know the source of lies. Jesus told us in John 8, beginning in verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Murder and lies. What's going on here in the temple with Paul? They're trying to kill him on the basis of having lied about him. When people must resort to lies to get you into trouble, it means you must be doing right. But it also means the attack is coming, not merely from the people, it's coming from Satan who hates the truth. Are you faithful in presenting the gospel of Christ? Are you faithful in standing up for the truth of the word of God, regardless of the cost? Then you will find that there are those who lie about you because they have nothing that they can say honestly that is evil about you. And after all, Liars don't care about being honest, do they? Lesson number six. Their accusations will often be based on inference, suppositions, and half-truths. They'll mix some truth in there, but they're going to infer a lot of things, and they will imply to others a lot of things. They will establish some presuppositions that are false presuppositions. You know, if you start with a false premise, you always end up with a false conclusion unless you have a leap in logic. You learn that in basic logic. You've got to start with the right premises. If you don't start with the right premises, you are going to end with a wrong conclusion. So if they can convince their audience 
based on false premises, such as evolution does today, they inexorably end with a false conclusion. For example, the evolutionists say, we see these millions of fossils all over the earth. And that must be a proof that things lived and died over millions of years because we see all these different rock layers. They start with a false premise, which, you know, is the millions and billions of years of earth history. But they deny the flood, as Peter tells you. He says in the last days they're going to come, they're going to deny it. The world was in the water, now the water, and standing in the water is overflowed with water. You know, the flood explains every one of the fossils, every one of the rock layers. Millions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth, laid down by water. False premises lead to false conclusions. So their accusations will often be based on inference, suppositions, and half-truths, because it tells us, verse 29, for they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian. They recognized Paul out in the city, but you know they couldn't do anything in the city. Because out there in the city, that was a secular world. That's the Gentile world. That's the unclean world. But here in the temple, this is the holy place. They saw Paul out there, and he's walking around with an Ephesian. Maybe it was the way Trophimus was dressed. Maybe it was because they knew who Trophimus was because they were Jews from Asia. Maybe they knew that Trophimus was one of those ugly converts to Christianity where a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Oh, how filthy can you get? But now Paul is in the temple. They don't see Trophimus with him. They see seven other guys with him, but they don't recognize them. But they see Paul. And so they infer, and so they state, that he is bringing Gentiles into the temple. Now, when people falsely accuse you, it's often... And this is very, I think, a very important insight. When people falsely accuse you, it's often because they are merely reflecting their own character. When people falsely accuse you, they are merely reflecting their own character. What they would do if they found themselves in a similar situation. We always think other people have the same pet sins that we have. We expect them to respond in the same sinful ways that we respond. That's the basis for most carnal secular advertising. I'm sure you're aware of that. Although they don't call it that, advertisers have learned to manipulate the old sin nature and the seven deadly sins that we've discussed in detail. And they know that those things lie in the heart of every man, woman, and child. And so they manipulate them. That's the way they think. And so they know that the majority of people out there will be interested in their product if they can manipulate lust. So, so they're trying to sell laundry detergent. Please buy our laundry detergent. It will clean your clothes. No. Or do they have a very attractive young woman uh, pouring it into the thing and talking all about how cool this is? They use lust. They use covetousness. Have it your way and pride. They show you this car, sleek, and, you know, really cool dude driving the car. What are they appealing to your spiritual nature. You need to buy this car so that you can more perfectly glorify the Lord Jesus Christ because you need transportation to get from evangelistic point number one to evangelistic point. Have you ever seen an advertisement like that on television? I don't think so. Now you've seen some, some TV preachers who have done that, but you sure don't see the secular companies advertising their cars that way. When people falsely accuse you, it's because they're often reflecting their own character. But you know what the strongest antidote for that kind of accusation is? It's having a clear conscience. We're back to 1 Peter again, chapter 3, verse 16. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Paul had a clear conscience. You remember when he stood before the high priest, and he said, I've exercised a clear conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest said, hit him in the mouth. But Paul had a clear conscience. Doesn't matter what others do. Do you have a clear conscience? Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good conversation in Christ. How do you get a clear conscience? 
Hebrews chapter 9 explains how to get a clear conscience. It is possible to have a clean conscience through the blood of Christ. Verse 13 of Hebrews 9, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, that's what they did in the Old Testament, blood of bulls and goats. The, the red heifer, the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean. If that sanctifies or sets apart to the purifying of the flesh, there's something even better. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. We've been talking about this at Passover, morning worship services. Offered himself without spot to God. Now the next three words, purge your conscience. The blood of Christ is not only available for the forgiveness of your sins. The blood of Christ is available for the cleansing of your conscience. Those of you who have painful consciences, things that you've done in the past, things that every time the devil drags them in front of you, you weep and cry and fall on your knees, your heart is rendered with pain. Did you know you can say to the devil, that has come under the blood. That has been forgiven. My conscience is at peace with God because of the blood of Christ. That's what lets me serve. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The devil doesn't want you to serve. Paul was serving. The devil wanted to kill him. But Paul had a clear conscience. Peter served. The devil wanted to kill him. Put him in jail. They were going to kill him, but God let him out. Peter had a clear conscience. Peter says, have a clear conscience. Paul explains in Hebrews 9 how to have a clear conscience. You know, I have a, a good friend from many years ago, lives in another state, who has a very carnal wife. I won't tell you his name, won't tell you what state he lives in. But he's a very good friend for many years, who has a carnal wife, and his wife often accuses him. She plays the devil's advocate. She often accuses him of the many wicked things that he did many years ago when he was a young man. You know, her attacks are very painful to him because she knows of all those things that he used to do. But he always very calmly responds. Paul could calmly respond in this situation here. Here's how he responds. That's the old man that I was when I was lost. But the old man is dead. I'm a new man in Christ. His conscience has been, played, has been purged from dead works to serve the living God, which he does with faithfulness and with diligence. Lesson number seven. The mindless masses. Oh, I love that phrase. The mindless masses. <laughs> Always respond with knee-jerk reactions to wild and reckless accusations. The mindless masses. Always respond with knee-jerk reactions to wild and reckless accusations. We're certainly seeing that here in the passage. Nobody knew what was going on. Even when, when the centurion asked, what in the world did this guy do? All kinds of people are yelling all different kinds of things. They had no idea what he had done. They just were going to go kill him. How bizarre can you get? The mindless mass is going to go kill somebody, and they don't even know why they're killing him. You know, we see that especially in some of the ways Christians respond in panic to what's going on in the world around us today. We've talked about that in Sunday morning messages all the things that are happening in the world. Instead of quietly and carefully and deliberately taking necessary actions based on facts. The city was moved. All the people ran together. They took Paul. They drew him out of the temple. Forthwith the doors were shut. As they went about to kill him, tidings came into the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Mindless masses responding with a knee-jerk reaction to wild and reckless accusations. You know, Paul demonstrates the principle and how to respond in this passage, but he expounds on it theologically in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 
beginning in verse 1. Paul's asking them to pray for him. Now, if the Thessalonians, if Paul could ask the Thessalonians to pray for him, I certainly can ask you to pray for me. But here's what Paul said. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. That was Paul's motive. That's why Paul stood on the stairs. That's why Paul put his hand up and told, you know, motioned for them to be quiet. And why they settled down, there was a great silence, it says. So that he could have free course that the word of the Lord would be glorified. Verse 2. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. The mindless masses always respond with knee-jerk reactions to wild and reckless accusations. Pray that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Verse 3. Uh, here is the answer to the problem. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. We have a faithful God. Nothing happens outside his will. If we're in the center of his will, it will get us into trouble with the unsaved of the world and with carnal Christians. But the Lord is faithful. And God is in control of every detail of every one of our lives. Do right. Leave the results to God. Do right. Leave the results to God. Let me say it again. Do right. Leave the results to God. You will suffer in this world. Think it not strange concerning the fire trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are the partakers of Christ's sufferings. Do right. Leave the results to God. You know, our, whenever things like that happen to us, our, our carnal response is often to get angry or to get bitter or to get resentful. But you know, anger and bitterness and resent only hurt you. <laughs> Let me paraphrase a very interesting quote that I read recently. I loved it. I thought, man, that is good. Here's the quote, slightly paraphrased. Being bitter and resentful is like drinking poison and hoping the other guy will die. <laughs> Being bitter and resentful is like drinking poison but hoping that the other guy will die. Is that smart? I think not. You know, it really doesn't matter what other idiots do. It really doesn't matter to you. Many times I just have to shrug my shoulders and say, it doesn't matter. I've done that a lot around here. <laughs> you know, I roll my eyes and I just think, when I was younger, I would have gotten mad about it. It doesn't matter what other idiots do. God is sovereign. God loves you. You are in the center of the palm of his hand. There is no need to panic. When the crisis comes, and it will come, when the crisis comes, relax. And look to him in the eye of faith. God will give you the required direction to be the center of his will. That direction may be a way of escape. That direction may be an opening for greater service. Paul got both of those here in our passage. He had a way of escape. The Romans came and got him. It opened greater service. It got him with a free ticket all the way to Rome to witness to Caesar. It may be a period of suffering for your refinement. That's what Peter talked about. It may be that he's about to usher you into the courts of heaven. But remember, you can always trust him because he always does the thing that is for your best good. I would like to get into lesson number eight, but lesson number eight is a long lesson. And then we've got nine and ten too. So I think we'll save those for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you are our Father and that we can come to you as our Father, that we can call you Abba, Father. You're the one who loves us. You're the one who cares for us. You're the one who directs our lives. You're the one who wants us to be in the center of your will. You're the one who chastens us when we sin. You're the one who blesses us when we do what's right. You're the one to whom we can always leave the results. And so in faith, regardless of human suffering and circumstances, we can always trust you and commit the keeping of our souls unto you as unto a faithful creator. 
Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the practical application that we've seen tonight. We pray that you continue to give us applications day by day so that you might conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, that you might knock off our rough edges, that you might mold us and shape us, that you might cause Christ to be seen in us when others look at us, when they hear our speech, when they see our actions, when they perceive our motives and our attitudes. Father, make us like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight, much in line with what we've just talked about. Number and we're going to